Good afternoon and welcome to the 100th of the COVID calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today, I talk with disaster anthropologist and my friend and research collaborator, Kim Fortune. Then I'm joined by science writer and policy expert, Lori Garrett. After my discussion with Lori Garrett, I will introduce you to the COVID Calls production team and then maybe say a few words about the future of COVID Calls. I wanna thank you all for joining this 100th episode and for joining the previous episode if you've had time to do so. And I look forward to sharing these discussions with you all today. Just a reminder that you can catch COVID Calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID Calls on Facebook Live and on Periscope. You can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. And you can also keep up with COVID Calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please do help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and future topics. And please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. Let me introduce my first guest. Kim Fortune is professor University of California, Irvine's Department of Anthropology. Her research and teaching focus on environmental risk and disaster and on experimental ethnographic methods and research design. Her book, Advocacy After Bhopal, Environmentalism, Disaster, New World Orders was awarded the 2003 Sharon Stevens Prize by the American Society. She has many ongoing projects working on a book right now titled Late Industrialism. She also has a project called The Asthma Files, which is a collaborative project to understand how air pollution and environmental public health are dealt with in different contexts. She's also co-designer of the platform for experimental and collaborative ethnography known as PEACE, which is an open source access digital platform for anthropological and historical research. And she co-edits a book series which I'm lucky enough to be the other co-editor for the University of Pennsylvania Press titled Critical Studies and Risk and Disaster. Kim Fortune, good to see you. Hi, Scott. Nice to be here. I want to start out our, our discussion here just asking you um, where you're calling in from and what is the COVID-19 situation there today? As you said, I'm in um, Southern California and my small niche of the world is pretty quiet. I'm in uh, Irvine near the university campus, but COVID in California is of course, um, harshly unevenly distributed. The state passed 10,000 deaths just this week. There's uh, over half a million people infected. Uh, so we're, it's still um, in high crisis mode. Uh, importantly, the, the crisis is extending and coupling with other disasters. The, um, as is happening across the country, um, stays on evictions are about to end. Um, unemployment's about to end. Um, questions of schooling are still up. Um, and that, that those, those issues are also just, um, unevenly distributed. One, um, uh, bright moment uh, that should have happened a long time ago. The county uh, that Oakland and San Francisco are in, Alameda County, has just passed legislation to give people the financial resources they need if they test positive so that they will stay home. And so it's really uh, a, finally attention to essential workers and what they're going to need to stay kind of out of the flow of the pandemic. I mean, that should have happened back in April but it, it, it's, it's good that it's happening now. Mm -hmm. That's good news. So I wanted to ask you one question. We'll just have a little time today for some, just some conversation. And later on, I'll, I'll have a full hour to interrogate you about all of your research. But I did want to ask you this. Um, you came on March 17th on the second episode of COVID Calls. And according to statistics, I found there were 3,503 cases in the United States at that time in 58 deaths. Uh, it seems almost impossible to me that that was the situation, the context of that day in which we talked. And I guess I just wanted to ask you more generally, like how, how have you changed since then? 
Um, it's a big question. And I think that something I've been sobered by is uh, as someone who's studied disasters throughout my career, like you, um, I've known this, we were in for the long haul, that this was going to literally move the ground under our feet and both the disaster and our response to it would change the order of things. The extent of the pandemic and the extraordinary incapacity to respond to it um, has even, you know, caught me off guard. Um, and the, the extent of the rebuilding that we're going to have to do, the extent to which we're going to have to depend on a new generation of experts, uh, people that are our students right now in our university system, students, people that are in our kindergartens right now. So as we're, we're failing to attend to our kindergartens, we're not growing up the generation of people that are gonna be needed to rebuild what we've lost just, just in a few months. That kind of uh, insight, even in such a short period of time, I mean, it, it's to me, it really does speak to the many different dimensions that all of us are sort of struggling with on this. When you say you thought we were in in it for the long haul, it, were, were you thinking about that sort of epidemiologically, or you were thinking that whatever happens with the virus, the long tail of this is going to be like Bhopal or other disasters you've studied? I mean, is this this is yeah. really an intergenerational disaster? P partly because my area of expertise is not infectious disease. I've thought of COVID-19 as a hazard alongside and compounding with other kinds of hazards. Uh, in fact, in the fall, in a course I teach on environmental injustice, we're going to treat the COVID-19 um, hazard as a hazard alongside and compounding with ozone hazards and the hazards of no, having no healthcare access. And so I think that I don't, I don't know, I know barely enough, I know enough to be really afraid of the pandemic as an infectious hazard. Uh, but what I could see early on is the way that it was going, um, going to couple with other systems and thus get out of control in a way way beyond the biology of it because of its entanglement with the economic system and our school system, the need for, for coordination of, across scales of governance, which we're, we just don't have capacity for, much less across transnational borders. So mm -hmm. if, if one way to think about disasters is having problems to deal with for which we don't have institutional capacity and not just insufficiency, but insufficient coverage of ins institutional capacity, um, you know, no legal regime that holds activity to account, for example. Um, we clearly we clearly have that kind of incapacity uh, in in this pandemic. So there have been so many things, even in what you just said. I remember in our discussion back in March, I asked you what you were worried about. I've quoted this line so often, but it's because it's really profound. You said, I'm worried about a nuclear accident in South Texas, which was kind of this head snapping moment. Um, but was right on the money because, and I think we're seeing this at every turn. I mean, with the, the George Floyd murder and the economic collapse and the cascading disasters, and then all of the other kind of normal disaster preparations that have been shoved aside or layered on top of practitioners and said, you know, do this as well. It has denaturalized, denormalized, it seems like a lot of risk taking. In other words, it's, it's once again shown us all yeah. of these many things that are happening in our midst. But is that showing enough? I mean, what about action? Well, I think the, I mean, this is where the kind of sobering long haul is that I don't think it's mystical, some of the things that we could do. Um, again, from my area of expertise as an educator, um, you know, we could have been setting up public internet capacity and building the technical capacity and doing the pedagogical designs to be ready to not have to go back to school in person and yet deliver education. And so there are many kind of points of intervention that um, haven't been taken in the healthcare system as well. 
Um, and so we're going to have to climb ourselves out of that hole, but in so doing, re rebuild how we make those kinds of decisions. I mean, it is ironic that the um, that we aren't treating teachers with K through twelve teachers with the kind of respect that would empower and encourage them to take on just the incredible feat of teaching ch children to read at a distance, for example. Um, or enrolling um, older kids in their education at a time when their future really is just this kind of open-ended mess. Um, so I think that the um, there's many points of action and we're, the clumsiness with which we're responding, um, it's shameful, um, it, but it's, um, but we also have to start somewhere building back. And that is you learn, you know, from watching different kinds of disasters unfold, the extraordinary um, building back that has happened. Um, so often building back uh, builds in second and third and fourth waves of disaster. And so we need to go into the work ahead of us here, mindful of that. Um, and something I, we've talked a lot about is, you know, in a disaster, you need to be so careful that um, you, you almost need to know in advance that the way you're seeing the problem is uh, inadequate to the scope of the problem. Because if, if yeah. the disaster really is out ahead of us, the adequacy of our established frameworks is part of the disaster. And so one of the things I find really compelling about COVID calls is that we need to invent new ways of making knowledge and insight that aren't just continuing the machine of knowledge production that we've had before. Because as, as good as that's been on some things, it's clearly not up to the kind of disaster we're dealing with here. Uh, I appreciate that. I mean, that's been something that um, I don't think I was, I sort of started this just on intuition, really, the idea that uh, we should be amplifying research voices and you know there's always that burst of news coverage that happens right at the beginning that does just you say whatever frames are there and available are going to make it into the news coverage and that is not a critique of journalists who are writing they have a deadline and they they reach for what's available to them and that's a disaster as an event disaster as a cycle disaster with recovery governmental aid you know the normal pieces of the puzzle that usually get assembled um but you know, pretty immediately in, in talking with folks, even in the first couple of weeks, I realized that the range of temporality, just thinking about time, how long will this last? A simple question like that opens up a world of possibility to speak back to the sort of normal framing of a disaster as a cycle or with some sort of a knowable timeline. And then added to that is that if you get diverse voices, I'm thinking about people like Rashawn Ray, who I had on, for example, Monica Sanders, Felicia Henry, Marcus Hendricks, and others, who've pointed out to me that um, in some communities, this disaster is was sort of happening. I mean, why do you start it at a at a particular date? And so that we we merge not only the COVID nineteen temporality with inheritances of disaster and inequality, and that becomes a pretty profound, I think, pushing back on kind of some of the normal frames that we that we enter it. I guess the other thing is I should have realized as a historian early on, we were making a record that this mm -hmm. set of calls was making a record yeah. um, that we already can refer back to. And I would say my thinking has already changed a bit on what we're living through, even in these months. Um, well, first, let me say that it should be on the record, too, that um, I imagine you as always having uh, dreamed of a life as a radio host. So <clears throat> that's one reason we're here in our hundredth call. But one reason so that you're so skilled in creating this kind of public knowledge space. And I'll say that one of one of my favorite things about the call is that by design, you've created a sp space that moves between theory and practice. People that are practitioners, you brought them into a space where we can hear them, but also giving them 
a moment to think analytically by the questions that you're not just analytically, they're analytically on their own. Think at different scales, which is what the kind of interviewing that you've done accomplishes. Um, but it also, you've brought people together in a way that works against um, reproducing the same ways of seeing the problems. And so the way that we can um, kind of creatively convene these kinds of um, uh, knowledge production moments like you've done in a way that is always asking, um, how is it that we're pro seeing the problem poorly? How is problem characterization itself an issue? Um, and then creating a record where you can come back and rerun the numbers, so to speak, where we can watch the very slow process by which things come to become obvious or make sense. Um, it, it's astounding that you have a hundred calls worth of, of, uh, uh, of interview archive. I mean, it's an incredible accomplishment. Well, the, no, I appreciate everything you just said. I, the, the, as speaking as a historian, it's the million words of transcript that gets me most excited. I mean, I, I enjoy having these videos too, because they are also capturing a moment in time, each, each one of them. Um, as a fellow yeah. Texan, I think you know also that there is a power in story, there's a power in letting people talk. You're an anthropologist, you really get that. We've had great anthropologists on, we've had great talkers on COVID calls. And one of the common things people have said is, oh, I really liked having that much time. We've all been in our homes now for months, and yet we still operate in this very compressed hour by hour work time schedule to have a little bit more time to think and talk. Many people have said, I really just appreciated that we could talk for 20, 30 minutes or an hour and not five minutes, which is a usual hit when some expert is asked what they think about something. Yeah. Tell me what is, um, how have you changed your thinking about the kind of spaces and exchanges that we need to create in our society? to create the knowledge we need to understand our context, to respond to it, to devise creative solutions. Because um, if, if you almost think of this as almost like a new poetic form, it's a new form of knowledge production. It's not just content. Um, you know, what does this tell us about the, the structures that we do need to build going forward? Well, I think that's a, I don't have, a complete answer to that yet, but one thing is for certain is we need more iterative spaces that are not just the academic conference and that are not just the, uh, I mean, we're going to hear from Lori Garrett today. She's on interviews all the time, but most of those interviews are really short, you know? So I think people are often constrained um, by the wrong formats um, they need to be able to say more or they need to be able to say on an ongoing basis, almost like a journal. And, um, you know, academics need to be able to work out ideas. And you mentioned with practitioners, and I believe that's absolutely right and true. I think that's what um, they've been, you know, like what the Hazard Center in Boulder, what Lori Peake is the director of. I mean, that's what that center has fostered over time. Mm -hmm. But that's a once a year meeting and so a COVID calls or a COVID calls like venue opens up the possibility that you could draw together a community um, that can share on an ongoing basis. Maybe it doesn't have to be every weekday, uh, but it can be more frequently than annually. And not to mention the pace of academic production, which is inadequate to the times that we find ourselves in. What have you learned about tactics for getting around what I think of as predictable speech, uh, where you know you want to hear people thinking about what they're learning from practice or from encounters with new data sets, um, and you know part of the genre of the five-minute interview is you've got to be on point. So you really have to Absolutely. go in knowing what you're going to say. You can't puzzle through it with an interviewer, and but I'm sure that you've. Um, 
in your preparation for calls, you, you've worried about getting predictable speech um, just because, I mean, the irony is people feeling like they need to be prepared means that they walk themselves sure. right into predictable speech. So what have you learned as an interviewer? One thing that has really struck me with this, and it was, I think I learned this from you and, and some others about not getting too hung up on talking about how we're going to define disaster or even how we're going to define terms going in. This is a hallmark academic problem. And we could spend an hour on how we're going to define all our terms before we even have a conversation. Getting people just to talk about uh, starting off, how it's going, where they are, to talk a little bit about that. Even just in that little moment, you find out those details are amazing, what kind of detail people will give, mm -hmm. and maybe draw that out a little bit more. Um, and then when we go into the research, not to draw hard boundaries between, you know, a hurricane, a pandemic, and an economic collapse uh, and racist violence, but just let the conversation flow into this disaster space. That's been, I think, to me, really eye-opening to see how many people actually do find risks at the core, we're talking about risk taking over time and systems of inequality. I mean, th those are like fundamental things that are coming through all of these. Maybe it manifests itself in hurricane preparedness, or maybe it manifests itself in um, some of the artists that I've talked to, you know, helping with in this time. But not not buying into those pre-baked categorizations has been a way, I think, to get. Um, deeper conversation. That's that's certainly been one of them. The other thing, and I want to work harder at this, but it's um, not to take the nation as the category. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, and I look back at my early notes uh, preparing for the hundredth and I did have like a list of countries and we have done some episodes that were countries, you know, like mm -hmm. COVID-19 mm -hmm. in Italy, but I tried to move away from that because just don't think the national scale, I think reinforcing the national, we can talk about the nation, but I think the nation as a scale is doing us disservice right now. I mean, you're, in, you're the peace platform is, is also intentionally taking a transnational look. Right. S did you decide early on that that was a tactic you wanted to use or you already had that built before the pandemic started? Well, the, the digital research space uh, that we use, the peace platform, is designed to support very distributed and heterogeneous collaborations. Um, so by design, it makes space for people situated in from different perspectives and wanting to really leverage where they're at, their kind of perspective on the world from that place. Um, and one way that we've, um, in we, we have a project running through the platform called the Transnational Disaster STS COVID-19 project, which, and you've had a number of the researchers from the project on the show. Um, but one of the ways that we cut across methodological nationalism is to think in terms of places, because we need to attend to what are COVID rates on the Navajo Nation or in Beirut or in Ecuador, but at the same time to have themes that we're tracking across so that we can begin to think about what does it mean to have data capacity in a place sufficient to characterize the problem you're dealing with? What are, the, what are forms of data distrust and distrust? And something that works really powerfully is that, you know, part of what a disaster does is it often literally physically, but also imaginatively limits your field of vision. And so really actively thinking with other places in order to think your own place and so it's um, so it's you know it's a it's a it's a movement across scale as a mode of thinking. And I'll just quickly point out that in in your earlier statement about letting people talk hurricanes, if that's where they went with this, um, part of what the COVID calls has done is opened a space for analogic thinking and a kind of expansive comparative discourse that really is a, a different kind of space than the 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 data intensive, quantitative data of intensive space, which is also critical in this moment. But the, but you know, we often talked about needing different knowledge forms, 
but seeing the kind of um, analogic discursivity of the COVID calls as one of its characters um, as a knowledge mm -hmm. form. And similarly in the design of research projects where you, I mean, one of the things that's taken actually a lot of discipline in our COVID project is not to try and codify it early on, to sort of just be watchful and ask what research needs to be done at this moment? Uh, what data do we need to be collecting? So kind of both first and second or and third and fourth order observations all in a mix. Mm. That's, um, I'm glad you're seeing all of that. And I'm, you know, having those conversations already sort of teed up. I mean, this is what you were, you were doing with the peace platform before, before COVID-19. I really feel like you anticipated not only the need to have the transnational discussion so that we don't get sucked into the daily death totals country by country or fall into the normal categories, but also to recognize that the academy right now is under attack as a knowledge production enterprise. And as such, we have to rely on network, new networks of researchers coming together in this moment. I think, again, if we sort of all move back to what we've thought of as a safe space, my department in my university, it's not serving us well right now. So some of this is also, you talked about tactics. Some of this is tactical about making sure that we get to continue to do our research, I think. And I don't yeah. wanna to be too grandiose about COVID calls, but I would love to see, and this is not the only version of this. There are many people doing different, you know, social media based and new media based projects. I'd love to see a thousand times more of it, franchise it and let people do these from what, at whatever scale and wherever they are. I think we need a lot more of this kind of yeah, iterative yeah. work, not only to produce the work, but also to produce the new network. I just think that's really super crucial at this time. Yeah. And it's, it's been nice that on COVID calls, you've had researchers and practitioners that at so many generational touch points. Uh, one of the most encouraging things about um, our COVID research project is we've got really um, uh, emerging researchers that are uh, stepping up to take on the challenge of asking, you know, what kind of cultural analysis needs to be done at this historical moment. And it certainly would be more efficient for them just to stay with whatever the project they had beforehand. But it is a, uh, it's incredibly enlivening to see people coming together across these geopolitical and institutional spaces and I'll say that if we think our academy is uh, in uh, structural freefall, try being in other context where uh, literally the, the grounds on which they walk, I mean, are just pulled out, being pulled out from under them. So we've got to figure out how to scaffold an infrastructure, sustained research collaboration, both inside and on the edges and outside uh, our universities. Kim, I want to thank you for making time for this discussion today. And I want to ask you one more question before we come to uh, Lori Garrett. And it's this, what do you want to see more of in future COVID calls? Um, I think that I want you to have educators and educational planners in um, even more than you have so far. And, you know, clearly I, uh, education is something that I keep my eye on as an edu um, educational professional, but seeing it as the, the grounds that, the grounds from which we're going to rebuild. Um, and so just having, uh, committing to education as essential work um, as the space of creativity is um, and, a, and a creative partnership between COVID calls and different kinds of educational institutions, libraries as institutions, elementary schools. Okay, I'm going to take that to heart. And in fact, Shivani Patel, one of my production assistants, is undoubtedly listening. And sh part of her, her charge uh, is actually to help us produce a series um, for the end of August of discussions with teachers at all different levels as they think about what it's going to mean to return to school or not return to school and what it's mean for teachers to relearn how to teach in lots of cases at a distance. So noted. Uh, thank you, Kim, so much for all of your 
uh, mentorship and wisdom in what you're doing, and people should check out the Peace Project. Can you tell us one more time where we can find that project if people want to check it out? Sure. It's at disasternetwork.org. Um, and that is a platform that brings together a number of different projects and critical disaster studies. And you can get to the COVID project from its front page. And okay. we're, it's Important. open to collaboration. So join us. Thanks, Scott. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Okay, I'd like to introduce my second guest today, Lori Garrett. Lori is the best-selling author of The Coming Plague, Newly Emerging Diseases in a World Out of Balance, also Betrayal of Trust, The Collapse of Global Public Health, I Heard the Sirens Scream, How Americans Responded to the 9-11 and Anthrax Attacks, and Ebola, a story of an outbreak among many other, many other books. Her expertise includes global health systems, chronic and infectious diseases, and bioterrorism. Lori Garrett is a native of Los Angeles. She attended graduate school in the Department of Bacteriology and Immunology at the University of California, Berkeley, and she did lab research at Stanford University, where she started reporting science news at radio station KPFA while a graduate student. And at that time, she won the George Foster Peabody Award for her work. In 1980, she joined National Public Radio, working as the network science correspondent. In 1988, Garrett left NPR to join the science and foreign desks of Newsday, she joined the Council on Foreign Relations in 2004 and served as Senior Fellow for Global Health. Ms. Garrett is the only writer ever to have been awarded all three of the big P's in journalism, the Peabody, the Polk, and the Pulitzer Prize. And in the midst of COVID-19, in the middle of this pandemic, her experience and her sharp insights have proven her an indispensable voice. And I'm absolutely thrilled to have her uh, as my guest today on COVID Calls for our 100th episode. Lori Garrett, thank you so much for making time to come on COVID Calls today. Hi, Scott. I'd like to start out asking you what I've been asking all of my guests, which is where are you calling in from and what does the COVID-19 pandemic look like there today? I'm in New York City. And so uh, I actually live very close in between what were the staging grounds for all the out of town ambulance services that came to assist us at the peak of our epidemic in March and April. And on the other side of my building is the major hospital that was receiving the lion's share of cases. So I spent uh, a little over two months with 24 hour a day nonstop sirens and uh, just an endless sense of death and danger. Um, we're now, as I think everybody knows, New York now has the lowest rate of new cases and deaths uh, from COVID occurring at this time. Um, we're coming out of our lockdown. Um, I'm still uh, a bit anxious about being out of the building and I don't go out very much. Uh, and, and I would say very few New Yorkers do at least those in my generation, younger people do. Um, and where we are now is uh, the governor just today said the state, the state desperately needs $30 billion. Um, we, we've been driven into deep debt, the edge of bankruptcy by the cataclysm that this city went through. And you know, we've basically walled the city off at this point. You could not travel here from most American states without going into two weeks of quarantine upon arrival. And the city is not kidding about this. It's serious. You will be interviewed at the airport. You will be required to wear a tracker or go into an isolation hotel or something. The city is determined that we're not going to go through this again. Um, and, uh, well, we've had a drop of 27% in real estate sales. We've had an exodus of people moving out of the city to the suburbs and real estate pr values are plummeting. I would say you could go down a long list of economic indicators yeah. and see the pain, um, uh, that we have continued to suffer. But at least I don't step outside and have a refrigerator truck with cadavers in it. 
right. as I did. As you did for the two months. It's such a reversal from, you know, I'm from Texas originally, and I remember uh, a few months ago when the governor of Texas made a big announcement that they would be stopping, uh, you know, cars at New the York. border of Texas. And, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that there yeah. and and to see this incredible reversal and the uptick of deaths in the deep south now, also in in California, and the re return to school, the never-ending drumbeat about the return to school. So you've given us this snapshot of New York. What do you see happening right now in this moment in the rest of the country? Where is this headed? We're in very deep trouble. At the moment, only eight states actually have their epidemic under control. Uh, and when I say control, I should probably, you know, caveat that a little bit, because I think one of the things that everybody's been slow to recognize is that this virus doesn't disappear. Control is a transient moment. You've got to be ready for that reemergence, that return. We've seen one country after another around the world that was a success story get hit again and again and again, and until we eradicate this virus or come up with a phenomenally successful vaccine um, and manage to actually vaccinate 7.5 billion human beings, a feat that's never previously been accomplished, um, we will be revisited by this virus over and over and over again. And we will have outbreaks and spread over and over and over again. In the United States at the moment, we are the worst performer in the world uh, followed on our heels by uh, Brazil, uh, India, and Russia. So there, there we are, and that's our company. Um, yeah. Europe is seeing occasional reemergences here and there, but they now seem to bring them under control quite quickly. Um, and that is in real contrast to what we're doing here. I, I, I really honestly can't think of very many things we've done right. One of the reasons I was excited to talk to you today was not only to get the sense of what's happening, but also to be in this broader context. And I want to give um, a quote here from your book, Betrayal of Trust, uh, which came out in 2000. It's from the epilogue. And you actually you start your epilogue talking about the Black Death, and you say, with epidemics, timing is everything. And I thought, well, first of all, that's like a great his historian. That's a historian speaking right there um, to draw that long connection from then to the what you were then projecting, thinking about the 21st century. So timing is everything. What lined up then? What was the timing that made this pandemic possible? And, and what lined up to make it so bad in the United States? Bad governance. I mean, there's there's really nothing else. It's bad governance. It wasn't. We aren't biologically especially vulnerable. There isn't some, uh, you know, magic sauce that the virus had that somehow takes out Americans. This is all about: Do you respond as a nation in an appropriate fashion? Now, one usual advantage, but in this case, in the case of pandemics, disadvantage that we have as Americans is that we have a very unique public health infrastructure. Um, you know, I spent a fair part of my second book, Betrayal of Trust, detailing how it evolved and how it's structured and how this public health apparatus has responded historically. Um, you know, most of the public health apparatus uh, in Europe, for example, were created as royal entities. So the King of France created mm -hmm. this or the, you know, the head of whatever nation state um, designated a public health apparatus. And they often came at, really out of the 14th century, out of the experience with the plague, um, and then evolved from there as uh, perhaps through trade or warfare, diseases would get introduced uh, within the castle walls, if you will. And that would result in some sort of um, profound response from whatever was designated to be public health. And this all really took off with the discovery of germ theory of disease. So once, you know, we understood that what bacteria were, um, though, you know, 
it's not till the mid 20th century that we have any real good idea about what viruses are, but bacteria, you know, by, by the mid uh, 19th century, we were well on our way to, to profound knowledge. And of course, it just exploded from the 1880s through the 19 teens. And that led to real creation of public health infrastructures uh, that were based on germs, based on the notion of the germ theory of disease. Um, well, in the United States, everything about public health, going all the way back to when we were a British colony, um, was local. So by definition, we never had the equivalent of that royal society on top, setting national policy and dictating it downwards. We were always about, um, you know, Los Angeles will do its thing, you know, Chicago does its, New York does its, Maryland does its. And speaking of which, there goes a police helicopter. <laughs> well, I wonder what that was. Yeah, it sounded okay. like it was in the room with you. Well, yeah. I'm up high, so they go right by me. Um, yeah. And uh, so the this led to a system where there's real com community control of public health, um, which in theory means community buy-in, but it's also a problem because community standards vary from one part of America to another. That was true from the outset and it's more true today. You see it with COVID everywhere you look. So what is what are community standards of public health in Houston, Texas versus in St. Louis, Missouri versus Los Angeles, California versus Brooklyn? You know, it's widely variant and we have no national standards. So the way historically we cut through this, for example, dealing with HIV in the early days of the 80s, when many community standards were about lock up and kill homosexuals, destroy them. Right. They are the disease, not the virus. These human beings right. who have particular sexual preferences, we shall destroy them. You had state legislatures calling for tattooing men's penises if they were gay so that they could be quickly identified by medical providers. I mean, horrible things like this. And the way we overcame it was by having standards that were set higher, uh, both in terms of the standard of science and the standard of morality by the Centers for Disease Control. Now, the Centers for Disease Control is not a regulatory agency. It's an advisory and research agency. So it never had the power to tell Florida, you must do this. In fact, it can't legally enter Florida without being invited in by the governor. Uh, but the, the sort of bully pulpit of CDC has always been quite powerful. This is the first time that we're facing an, a major epidemic threat in America with an utterly defanged, if not destroyed, CDC, with a president who openly um, holds the entire institution of public health in disdain. And with competing interests from organized medicine, um, the most sort of profitable side thereof, uh, superseding classic public health. So we're going into disaster. We're in disaster um, with no clear, coherent leadership of any kind. And that is why we're doing worse than our counterparts in Europe and Asia, uh, even in many parts of Latin America, we are in real trouble. It's it's amazing, and I think really important that you you approach it this this way because what you've explained basically is the history of American federalism and the sort of decentralization of power, which is supposed to be one of the sort of you know central achievements of the American constitutional system, if you want to view it that way. But then under this kind of a threat, it reveals what it can't do. And mm -hmm. I want to sort of come back to this because, you know, the the idea that um, germ theory and then understanding the virus and, and conquering infectious disease was the frontier from the 19th into the, into the 20th century. There are a point at which, though, that public health officials veered away from that or that the broader public health apparatus in the United States stopped focusing as much on that and started looking more at chronic disease and, and that somehow we're 
we're seeing the impact of that. I mean, I'm thinking about your critique of the CDC. I'm, I'm surprised that they haven't been able to stay on top or ahead of this situation. And it makes me wonder if the focus hadn't changed somehow. Well, if you if you go back, the, uh, there was a turning point and that was the discovery and, and widespread utilization of antibiotics. So once antibiotics come into routine use in medical practice, um, before drug resistance becomes an all consuming limitation of their utility, uh, you had miracles. You had Lazarus rising from the dead in hospitals all across right. America. And, and the medical profession, perhaps justifiably from their limited perspective, thought, you know, we're hitting the end of this. We don't have to worry about infectious diseases. Of course, antibiotics have no impact on viruses and no impact on parasites. So in, even if you thought they would be endlessly successful against bacteria, uh, you know, they, they weren't going to do anything about viruses. Um, the other problem and limitation of that course is that we did have drug resistance and now many of our antibiotics, our frontline products don't really work anymore against the key bacterial diseases. Um, and then the sort of second thing that came in was the, the golden age of vaccine development with through the late 50s into the early 70s, just one by one by one key childhood diseases start to just disappear from the medical practices of wealthy world doctors. And, you know, they just don't see measles cases anymore. They don't see mumps. Uh, right. or that was the case. Now, of course, because of vaccine opposition, all of those are resurging. And unfortunately, physicians today do see mumps. They do see pertussis. They do see measles in the United States because parents refuse to vaccinate their children. Um, nevertheless, all of that led to a sense of tremendous optimism and Congress started putting mandates on the CDC saying, you know, without giving you a big boost in your budget, we want to broaden your scope. So we want you to track heart right. disease and track this and track that. And then they added track gun use, track abor abortion rates, track automobile accidents. Pretty soon mm -hmm. what started out as an infectious disease agency it was a kind of all-encompassing repository of public health uh, without any really gigantic increase in its budget. Um, and then across America, we have, have seen uh, local health departments suffer huge budget cuts. Um, and some of those budget cuts have really gone to the bone. I mean, there's no fat. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, barely right. flesh on the bones. And, um, you know, you'd be surprised how many health departments across America have nobody trained in epidemiology on, on the entire staff. Uh, and how many health departments basically have part-time doctors who have their own private practice or work in a local hospital and also part-time take care of some public health issues. Um, and it's, it's really, it's atrocious. So we're, we were already very vulnerable and we saw that vulnerability writ large in one outbreak after another, starting with HIV and then going down a whole course series of things. And then of course, in 2001 with the anthrax attacks where everybody screwed up, the FBI screwed up, the police screwed up, the CDC, everybody screwed up. And, uh, you know, it was the longest and most expensive FBI investigation in the history of that law enforcement agency. And there, there's still doubt as to whether the man who committed suicide and was thereby named the assailant actually was the individual who mailed out the anthrax spores. That led to a whole kind of bioterrorism focus, a securitization of CDC and public health departments from you know, tiny middle of nowhere, Montana, you know, county departments all the way to New York City and Los Angeles were required to go through endless drills of bioterrorism assaults and to have preparedness for anthrax and smallpox and all sorts of things that were arbitrarily decided to be likely weapons to be used by Al Qaeda. And, uh, you know, by the time we come out the other side of that, we've, Right. really damaged our public health capacity all across America.
And now here we are faced with a real, genuine, cross-cutting threat. No one is immune, literally immune physically, but also immune metaphorically. And it is threatening every single part of our society. And we just don't have an infrastructure there to deal with it. And we need a federal overarching scheme, a federal overarching strategy, and we don't have one. I want to remind people that you're listening to COVID calls and I'm talking with Lori Garrett today. Um, he's come up already twice. I think we have to kind of deal with this and I want to get your, your sense of it. I mean, you've just described a situation of disinvestment in public health infrastructure, uh, chasing the wrong bets after 9-11. And to that point, I remember interviewing public health experts at that time who were basically telling me we're learning how to write um, counterterrorism grants to do the other stuff that we need. So they just had to learn all the new counterterrorism lingo. But I was going back in, in, in preparation for talking to you and, and I found Ebola tweets from Donald Trump in 2014. Mm -hmm. I just, I guess I just ask you as a broad question. I mean, even with all of this disinvestment, how do you capture the Trump effect in this moment? I mean, it, it is it so, bad already that somebody like him can literally topple it? Or does he have, has he seen through those weaknesses somehow and exploited them in a, in a uniquely um, careful way? I mean, it seems like he's almost well, Trump, beyond Trump the creativity could, I would have imagined. Scott, Trump could not have done the damage that has been done without co-conspirators uh, among the GOP members of the House and in particular the Senate. This, this didn't just happen because one guy is a germaphobe with weird politics. It happened because uh, there's been a dramatic change of the Republican Party. This, I mean, Dwight David Eisenhower wouldn't be allowed in today's Republican Party. I doubt even Ronald Reagan would be allowed in today's Republican Party. Um, and it's, it's not a party that puts governance first and foremost. It puts ideology first and foremost and it's you you can't but uh battle an in emerging disease ideologically you have to take all your prejudices your you know personal views sh shift them over to the side and concentrate on what do you know about this microbe what are its vulnerabilities how can you protect people from this terrible new scourge uh, and that's a governance problem. That's a biology problem. It's a medical problem. It's a public health problem. It should not be about saying Kung, Kung Fu flu or Kung flu virus or whatever it was he said right. and China virus and all yeah, this yeah. stuff. And, um, you know, I would say that, you know, Trump is hardly the only guy that has screwed up his country's response. Let's look at Bolsonaro in Brazil. Uh, let's look at Xi Jinping in China. Let, we can go down a list of Vladimir Putin in Russia, um, uh, Narendra Modi in India. They've all horribly screwed up their country's responses. Um, but it's more than just a, a one bad leader. America doesn't crumble in the face of a virus because of one man. This uh, again takes me back to betrayal of trust, and and I remember in there you you said I don't have the words exactly in front of me, but something about how the future of public health was going to be connected with the future of globalization. As we go into the 21st century, whatever ends up happening with globalization is going to predict what's going to happen. I presume in situations like well, certainly be a Ebola, but what we're living with right now. So I guess I just sort of ask you. <laughs> Back to that. What have we learned about yeah. globalization in this moment? Well, it's and, bad, you know, it's and there you bad go. Moves, another, but. another case where the timing favors the microbe because uh, mm -hmm. globalization was on its way out uh, before we, did, we recognized that COVID is in our midst. Globalization was already really crumbling. And the, the key factors that brought globalization uh, under assault all had to do with the 2008 financial crisis and the subsequent 2010 euro crisis, uh, all of which ushered in leaders 
that were nationalists and opposed globalization and opposed the United Nations system, opposed the idea of uh, any sort of multilateral agency setting forth policy for a, a nation state to follow, um, and certainly opposed any monitoring of the performance of individual nations by vis-a-vis uh, -vis some you know global barometer. Um, on all those counts, Trump, of course, has led the way, and withdrawing from the World Health Organization is only one piece of it. He's also looking to withdraw from World Trade Organization. He wants the World Bank fundamentally altered. He's opposed to most of the patent regimes, uh, pr special provisions that um, make medicines affordable for poorer countries. Um, we could go down a long list, a very long list. And so, you know, you're right. In 2000, when I published Betrayal of Trust, globalization was on its ascendancy. And we could basically say that the post 9-11 period was really the, you know, the zenith of globalization. Um, nations from all over the world came to the support of America, wanted us to be the leader of the world, wanted us to come through terrorism, through anthrax, through all of it. Um, unfortunately, we squandered it by invading Iran, Iraq, and in a way that is widely opposed uh, across the world. Um, and well, we could go into long dissertation about how we squandered our opportunities in the Middle East and what we're left with today. But the real point is we had a golden moment. And in terms of public health, this all translated into, you know, record amounts of money pouring into global health, the creation of multiple new agencies, Gavi to deal with vaccine vaccinations around the world, um, the global fund to fight HIV, tuberculosis and malaria, um, expanded capacities at WHO, on and on and on. And all this looked like, you know, cause for tremendous optimism. Um, and certainly the Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates, who have been, you know, the biggest funders of all things global health right. in, in recent um, years, uh, have their blog, which is called The Optimists. You know, it was a time of great belief that one by one diseases could be conquered. And I, you know, I, I really think this all started with Jimmy Carter, who, you know, once he stepped out of the White House, went straight to trying to eradicate parasitic diseases, mostly in Africa, and set up his, uh, you know, Carter Foundation, completely oriented around this optimistic belief that Americans who did not experience river blindness you know, did not experience schistosomiasis, that we hmm. could, in partnership with countries overseas, um, eradicate diseases that mostly plagued and killed uh, people living far, far, thousands of miles away from us. Um, and it's had tremendous success. I mean, absolutely astounding success for very modest amounts of money. Um, and I think it was the Carter concept that had a big impact on the early stages of the Gates Foundation, fueled by a similar level of optimism that you can go to the global stage and bring partners in from all parts of the world to conquer a disease phenomenon. Um, I think those days are now gone. And that, that closure, which you sort of bring back to 9-11, to I mean, I feel like, you know, with the 20th anniversary of 9-11 coming up, we see, or, or I had already been thinking about how we would remember that anniversary early this year. And I, I think we will remember that anniversary now very differently than we would have pre, pre-February, I think, to a certain extent. I, I, I want to ask you something specific about that before I lose Trump entirely, which is about the pandemic task force, even, even instruments that the government had that you would have thought would have been terrorism e you know that would have been national security sort of sort of leaning even those seem to have been disbanded defunded de defanged were you surprised when that task force was uh taken out of the national security council or that didn't 
maybe you were already raising the alarm before then and that didn't surprise you, but could you linger on that moment for a second? Because it has gotten some news coverage. Well, um, you're right. I was already aware that it was gone, that it had vanished. Um, and that the Trump uh, leadership, the coterie around him when he came in uh, in January 2017 um, was very suspicious of all things that smacked of mission creep for national security. And in that sense, it's not unusual. I mean, you know, it, uh, George Bush Sr., Ronald Reagan, um, both were really opposed to this sort of expansion of concepts of national security. Neither wanted diseases in, or pandemic threats, and certainly not climate change, to be part of anybody's concept of national security. Um, Trump, in a way, is a throwback. You know, his perspective of national security is very old fashioned, uh, though he probably sees it quite differently. Um, and yeah, by, by uh, insisting that um, transnational threats, not threats that directly target our national sovereignty issues, but that indirectly affect our uh, stability, um, prosperity, and well-being, uh, should be considered national security threats. When I first went to the Council on Foreign Relations in 2004, the council and most of the big think tanks and national security wonks all considered global health kind of laughably present. Hmm. I mean, I don't think they ever would have even had a global health program at the council if it hadn't been that Bill Gates gave them a pile of money and said, make one. <laughs> and, um, oh, really? You know, and so they followed the money. But uh, my, in those days, I found going to meetings all over Washington that people were, you know, what, what are you doing here? What's this got to do with security? The big turning point was um, H5N1, the bird flu in China, which mm -hmm. when it infected humans, killed 60% of them. Think about what we're dealing with right now with a microbe that kills less than 1% of those it infects. Right. And imagine if this killed 60%. Um, when H5N1 mutated in 2005 into a form that could infect a broader range of bird, wild bird species, it was carried from out of China up into Siberia and over into Europe and down into North Africa. And there was really good reason to believe that the Siberian spread could also go over the Bering Sea into Alaska. And, uh, and I found that when I went knocking on the doors at uh, the National Security Council, uh, they were very receptive and very concerned. And so it was actually the Bush administration that was the first to create a national pandemic flu plan. And that laid the first groundwork for the idea of a national level superstructure um, related to the possibility of uh, newly introduced diseases. Just want to remind people that we're listening to COVID calls and I'm talking with Lori Garrett. You can get your questions in on YouTube live. Just put them right in the chat or you can put them up on Twitter. Just be sure to tag at US of Disaster. Um, Lori, I'd like to go back if I could. I was looking at your articles that won you the Pulitzer Prize in 1995 on um, the Ebola outbreak and um, they're it's astounding journalism. And I guess it's a very broad question, but I'm wondering if you'd be willing to reflect. Many of the people who listen to COVID calls are also, they're researchers who study disasters across the board in public health or in social sciences, but also many of them are science communicators. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what's changed in science journalism since then. Could a, could a journalist go out and report those stories today? What might be different? I guess I'd like to sort of engage you in a little bit of a conversation there as a way to also maybe encourage people who want to engage in science communication now and want to tell these these stories. What do you see as the difference between um, now and then? Well, when Ebola broke out in Kikwit Zaire in 1995, 
Um, journalism was well funded. I worked for an institution that had plenty of money to send me over to Zaire and allow me to be there for weeks on end. Uh, and, you know, the, the likelihood of transmitting information minute by minute from Central Africa didn't exist. You couldn't. I remember I had uh, CNN had given me a satellite link um, because they wanted me to also report for CNN. And the satellite mm -hmm. link weighed 55 pounds and you had to attach it with cables to a car with the engine running <laughs> to power it. And then you had to use a set of, of guidebooks to find a satellite to bounce off of, you know, turning this thing, very yeah. difficult, find a satellite to bounce off and send a signal to CNN. And this was just for a darn phone call. Uh, you know, now, of course, everybody's out there with their cell phones and their cell phone, you know, that device could do about 1% of what this thing can do, right? Um, and this thing can, uh, you know, allow me to pretty much make a call from anywhere in the world unless there's censorship or um, my battery runs out. Uh, and that that's utterly transformative. I mean, what we have now is a situation where journalism is dying in gasps of, of poverty. And uh, there's very few institutions left that could possibly subsidize a reporter to go into the middle of an epidemic for several weeks um, on the hopes that you'll come out the other end with a good story, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Even in 2014, as recently as that, we had several good, smart teams of journalists combing across West Africa in the Ebola outbreak. One team, the New York Times team, won a Pulitzer Prize for their work. Um, but I will say there, that unlike past outbreaks, I saw very few camera crews. I saw very few photojournalists working on assignment. Um, it was really, really markedly a weaker response uh, because of finance. And now what I see is that a, the average viewer probably can't tell the difference, doesn't know when they get up in the morning and they start going through Twitter or Facebook or whatever they use, probably doesn't particularly know whether the writer whose work they're reading um, is backed by a bona fide journalistic institution where the work gets edited and fact-checked, whether the writer gets paid. And if they get paid, you know, is this a $50 piece? You'd be amazed. I mean, I, I remember back really? when it was routine to hear uh, five-figure offers for a story. And today you're lucky if you get $200 for a story. So what I think the big changes are, are beyond science reporting as a category, it's journalism generally. It's, it's, it's mm, in mm -hmm. dire straits financially, dire. The only institutions that are in good financial shape right now for journalism are ones that are heavily subsidized by some unusual situation, such as Jeff Bezos underwriting the Washington Post. Right. Um, uh, but by and large, advertising's in the tanker. Uh, you know, most people under 40 don't even think about going to a website of a newspaper or a website of a television station. They, you know, maybe to check for the weather report, but they're, they're all over Instagram and, you know, t t not even Twitter. Twitter's now, you know, old people, <laughs> you know, they're, they're all over whatever is the fastest, craziest, wildest news source. And 200 characters is pretty much the limit. But at the same time, I mean, the, the appetite for science news in this moment seems to be the most, the hardiest I've seen in, in my lifetime. I mean, this, it, it seems like a conundrum then we have, we, the greater need for in-depth journalism and reporting, which is transnational, the kind of work you've done, where you can look across national boundaries and actually consider the microbe as it moves across scales. Mm -hmm. We need much more of that, and people want that. 
the old legacy media structures are not up to it. So what kind of interventions are possible? Do you see any, any things that get you excited when you see new forms or things that you, you no, said, yeah, was, more I, of that? I was on a phone call with um, John Cohen from Science Magazine, Kai Kumferschmidt from uh, Science, um, let's see, uh, Helen Branswell from STAT, uh, a few others, and everybody was in agreement. We're all working the hardest we've ever worked. We're all get you know getting four or five hours of sleep a night, seven day a week schedules. Um, uh, you know, a sense of this is the biggest story of our lifetime, and um, you know, John Cohen coined the phrase that we're we're on the COVID fire hose. You know, every day the fire hose is shooting information down our throats, yeah, and you right. can, uh, just processing the volume is overwhelming. I mean, the average person isn't tapping into the stuff we're looking at. The this is unprecedented in the history of science. The amount of stuff going to pre-publication release. So every day there are a few hundred major COVID science papers that haven't even been peer reviewed yet that are coming our way. And we have to right. read them with scrutiny to pass judgment and find mistakes in them because they haven't been peer reviewed. Um, and that's everything from, you know, a crazy guy in Marseille claiming hydroxychloroquine, you know, cured his patients to, uh, complete, you know, science by press release from Moderna saying their vaccine worked. Where's the data? Oh, sorry, you can't see that. That's proprietary. Uh, and we're trying to make the best judgment we can of the validity of everything that's coming our way. But, you know, mistakes are getting made. And the mistakes sometimes are ours. And, but most of the time are, are in the science itself. Um, because they're rushing, they're going too fast. Right. They get very excited about a pile of data and pu put it out, and then whoa, we goofed. You know, uh, that it's we we overstated this or we understated that, and of course, then that feeds into all the conspiracy theories out there among the anti-science folks that you know it's all a big lie and. First, they told us not to wear masks. Now they tell us to wear masks. And Tony Fauci's a big liar and blah, 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 blah. And the notion that we are watching a great scientific investigation unfold in real time, the fastest ever, mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. Nothing comes close to what we're seeing as revelations about COVID and while globalization has collapsed in almost every other way, science is thoroughly globalized. You know, I'm up at three in the morning to watch a press conference in Beijing. And right. we're, you know, I'm, I'm on the phone with colleagues in Australia. We are seeing science shared. You look at papers and you see there'll be an author on a paper about, say, um, resurgent COVID in schools. Just that's a timely topic today. You'll see a paper and it will have authors from London, Paris, Bologna, uh, Kyoto, uh, Lagos, uh, you know, Wuhan, all on one paper. And this is just staggering, the scale of it. I, I just jumped from this, from a, another Zoom call to this. The other one I was in was uh, National Academy of Sciences having a, a five hour Zoom today uh, about, you know, reopening and the dangers of what's going on right now with COVID. And, you know, there are scientists from every part of the world on this thing. And they are all on via Zoom. Yesterday and the day before and the day before that, for three days, I was in the classic Aspen Security Summit, which usually is this very elite, very private event that takes place in one of the most expensive places on the planet, Aspen, Colorado, one attends only by invitation and either by paying a great deal of money or being an invited speaker. And, um, 
you know, the the papers never get released and it's all very sort of hush hush for the first time. Anybody could have participated this week and it was via Zoom. And you had everybody from Larry Summers, former Treasury Secretary, to, uh, you know, the Prime Minister of Singapore, or Foreign Minister of Singapore, the um, Finance Minister of Brazil, you know, on and on and on. Uh, right. the Secretary of Defense of the United States, et cetera. And COVID is in the middle of every single conversation. I mean, even right. if the topic yeah. was modernization of the U.S. military, you better believe COVID ends up being in that conversation. And, uh, right. you know, I think just to circle back to your original question, there's a lot of great science reporting going on right now. There's, uh, if I were to just start rattling off the names of writers who I think, and reporters who I think are exceptionally good, you know, we'd be here for another hour. Um, but people need to know that a lot of these folks are working at, you know, when they co really cost it out on an hourly basis, they're, they're, they're right there at minimum wage. And, uh, you know, nobody's getting rich off telling the stories. Nobody's getting rich off of trying to explain what's going on. Um, you know, I went through two months of, of the early stages of this where I wasn't sure I could make my mortgage payments. So, and, and you know, as you said, I've had a Pulitzer, a Peabody, and, you yeah, know, a right. Polk, two Polks. So uh, if you put this in perspective and think about it, um, you know, I really think that the your your viewers, your listeners need to understand just how fragile uh, journalism is. And then science journalism was always considered one of the lesser cousins. You know, when you got to the newspaper, it was the Washington reporters right. and the bigwigs in the sports department and so on that, that ruled. And we were always the little nerds off in the corner. Uh, so that's a long-winded get around the circle well, answer. I mean, it's 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 just so much insight there, and I wanted to pick up on part of it because because you did, I mean, the way you talked about this incredible um, output of scientific production in this moment and the speed of it is to me also really telling of this moment. And you had a great interview with Frank Bruni in the New York Times. You talked talked about you being the double. Is your phrase? I think maybe the, the double Cassandra. You've seen the future m multiple times, and um, in um, in there, you know, there seemed to be this this insight that um, there was also maybe new things were possible, and you know, this scientific output. You know, people are are uncomfortable waiting even for the end of this year to have a vaccine. You know, this this demand is there and science has maybe built that up to a certain degree, but science is going to produce at the pace that it produces. You said in that article that you thought there was a three year time horizon for this disaster, which I imagine when a lot of people read that, they thought, oh, my God, that's impossible. I think when a lot of disaster social scientists, researchers, science communicators read that, they think, yeah, that's OK. That's that's the pace that this is going to go within that. Is it possible that scientists can be better advocates and advocates, uh, activists in this in this moment? I mean, is that an opportunity in this moment? If they're going to be in the spotlight for the next three years as we move through this disaster, do you think scientists can become better advocates and, and literally activists? I know you've written about, you know, the role of activism and science in shaping public policy. I, I'm sort of wrestling with this myself and wondering how much we can be optimistic about that. As a, as a possibility here. I'm trying to find, I'm trying to find some optimism. I'm, I'm, <laughs> and it and feels like there's, you know, that's like, a space we just find it. Scott, your signal just deteriorated dramatically. Oh, sorry, we have, a thun we have a thunderstorm rolling through, but I guess my the ah, crux of okay. the question was with all it. of the I emphasis on you don't science. Need to repeat yeah. It. Um, oh, okay, sorry. So, uh, so, um, First of all, I think there are a lot of great scientific voices out there going out on a limb and really trying to um, not just advocate for a specific finding or countering a 
and incorrect findings such as the hydroxychloroquine story, um, but also feel the need to be explanatory, to um, dissect and analyze where we are at any given moment in ways that the average person can follow. Um, in Germany in particular, there's a scientist who just started doing kind of a casual podcast back, I think it, he started at the end of February, talking about COVID. And the last I heard, it was the number one most popular podcast in the German language. Uh, and he, people are riveted. And apparently Angelo Merkel listens to it, you know, uh, and he has a huge impact. And he's, he's a straightforward scientist yeah. saying, you know, let's look at this paper. Let's take it apart. Let me explain to you why, how I would go about analyzing whether or not this is a valid study, right? And bring you into the process, no matter who you are, what you do for a living. So you can also have a framework for analyzing and deciding if this piece of science is valid. I think the hard part for, there's a couple hard parts for scientists as communicators, especially in an emotional climate such as we're in now. Um, one is that they all use acronyms and terms that even their own colleagues don't understand because they're so specific to the niche of research that you're in. And so, you know, it's, I, I used to tell the joke that the worst conversations you ever had were with people in the defense department because the, one guy would say, well, I would use a glickum and the other guy, I'd use a slickum. And you're like, what's a glickum and what's a slickum? <laughs> oh, that's ground launch strategic missile. Oh, that's a big deal. Okay. Um, well, similarly in the sciences, you know, you, you, you stop for some people just when you say the acronym DNA. Right. And you get past that to very narrow and specific acronyms, you know, and uh, you say the CFR and people, what's a case fatality rate? Well, as it turns out, that's an actual debate among scientists. What, how do you define a case fatality rate? Um, and so that's another issue is that a lot of science is itself evolving and some of its most basic principles are in constant debate, constantly being reassessed. So it's not as cut and dry and absolute as the public would like. Um, and science writers, science reporters have the job of somehow taking the, the gray areas and making them accessible, but still gray. And that's really, really hard. Um, and then when you get into an emotional sense where people want real answers, they want a vaccine now. They want a cure now. And who could blame them? They want to know, is my, can my five-year-old go to kindergarten? Yes or no? You know, can I wear, take this mask off right now? Yes or no? Can I have my six friends over for drinks? Tell me now. They don't want to hear, well, there's this and then there's that. And then, of course, there's the background infection rate. And then there's this and then, oh, chihuahua, you know, you lost them. And uh, so what I find is that most scientists are not very good at figuring out how to explain that there's a variable range of possibilities or probabilities, uh, but here is an answer. They're very, very uncomfortable with that. They don't even do it well amongst each other with acronyms. They do it even worse out speaking outside of the envelope of science and stripping away all the, the jargon. It strikes me that that's something that can be taught. I mean, I don't know, there's 24 hours in the day. And as you pointed out, they're working as hard as they, as they can to get the vaccine and to answer to the uncertainty of the moment. And, you know, I'm thinking about what we need in terms of structures. You were talking so much about governmental structures and I think about knowledge structures and the academy and what we teach in the social sciences and humanities and in medicine. It just seems like there's, there's no way we can go forward without training people how to do this kind of, what you said, like explaining, keeping the gray, but making it accessible. I mean, what a phenomenal concept. It's a complicated world, but we can say things about it, and here they are, so that we can move forward 
with our lives. Well, you know, uh, you know just, it's, I wrote a long piece in The Lancet that ran about, uh, oh, it's probably three months ago now, in which I went right to this issue and really attacked um, funders of the major pandemic response elements because nobody ever funds the um, public information side. So for example, WHO, which is desperate for funding right now, um, the money tends to pour in for scientific research teams, for evaluation, blah, 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 but not for their communications department. They were greeting this pandemic and dealing with trying to process and figure out truth and fiction from what China was feeding them uh, with only five full-time people, one of whom was in charge of all social media on planet Earth in every single language and every single time zone. That was the staff. So, you know, my point in this Lancet piece was to say, you know, if you don't like the way the message is getting conveyed, then you should fund a professional army of people that translate information. And that's not the job for the journalist. It shouldn't be. It should be the job for your communications department. But if you don't take communications seriously enough to put money behind it and resources behind it, I mean, my classic was who the heck was so dumb that the phrase COVID-19 was not, I mean, you know, be, before you announce, we've decided to call this disease COVID-19. Shouldn't you have taken possession of hashtag COVID-19, Twitter site COVID-19, Facebook site right. COVID-19, so that you, before it's even announced, you have the brand, right? right? Wouldn't that be like, duh, for WHO? Similarly, you call it SARS-CoV-2, horrible name. Wish they'd never done that, but okay, they did. They should have branded it. They didn't. And they didn't have people on board that even knew really how to do these things. They do now, finally. They've brought a more professional team in. Um, but honestly, it's too late. And you look around uh, and ask, why is this scientist getting a lot of airplay and this one not? Um, a lot of times it's because of the nature of their communications department at their university or whatever institution they work mm. in. And it has almost nothing mm. to do with the quality of the message or how smart the messenger is or how well that individual performs on camera. It's really, they have a good team behind them. We're almost up on time with our discussion here with Lori Garrett. I just wanted to get one more quick, if you'll indulge me, just real quick question. Um, at the end of that uh, Frank Bruni article, the Cassandra piece, there's a, there's a photograph of you, I think, I'm assuming on the roof of your building, um, and you've got symbols, you're clanging the symbols. And I've had on COVID calls at Marco Leonhardt, who's a taiko drummer he in New York City, and he's played taiko uh, on the roof. I had uh, Ishmael Houston Jones, who's performed dance on the roof. I've talked with so many people who have found a way to keep their stamina through this. And coming right back to where we started, you talked about those two months of the sirens. You've reported on disaster your entire career, um, and yet you're still banging the symbols. Is there is there w something you can leave us with in terms of how, as a researcher and a communicator, you find the stamina? Like, well, they were keep going. They're not, they're not symbols. They're uh, lids to my pots, pots <laughs> and pans. Um, Improvised. Uh, they yeah. were symbols, but <laughs> yeah, it's, it's symbols with an S. Um, yeah, literally. Well, stamina is a real issue. I mean, I I think all all of my colleagues, my science friends, my everybody that's in the middle of this COVID thing is all facing periodic bouts of exhaustion. And I I would say for those of us that have been under lockdown, it's even worse in a way because. Uh, you know, I don't really feel like I can go somewhere for a vacation. Um, just take some R&R &R and uh, go lay at a beach somewhere. That would be, I, I mean, I, I fantasize, but I don't know how and when that will be possible. Uh, I was talking to a friend who um, 
went to see her parents in Florida before this surge happened in Florida, thinking, okay, I'll get a little beach time, I'll relax and I'll take care of my parents. And now she can't come back to New York unless she's prepared right, to go into quarantine. two week quarantine. Um, yeah, of and, and I, the other side of this is that usually the payoff for me in an epidemic is that I'm on the ground, I'm in the middle of it, I'm seeing it. And I'm seeing the heroes in action. I'm seeing the the positive sides of humanity. But when you're in lockdown, you're only seeing what's online and what you can get on the phone. And if you can get somebody you're talking to to hold their camera and move it around so you can get some idea of what's going on in the ER. But you're it's not, I'm not on site. And I'm now old enough that I'm in a risk group. So it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to go into the wading into the middle of things the way I usually would in an epidemic. I've been in more than 30 epidemics over the years and I never really felt um, that the risk was beyond measures I could easily take common sense to protect myself. You know, I never thought when I was covering HIV that I would get HIV. I never thought covering Ebola that I was, going to be dumb enough to get exposed um that it it seemed like i i had the right although i did make mistakes but you 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 realize that later um foodborne disease is another matter you just stop eating <laughs> um but you know i have i have come down with cholera and it is a horrible disease and you don't want to get it trust me um, and that sobered me up and made me think, well, I got to take better precautions. I have managed to travel all over the equatorial regions of the world and never get malaria. And I, I don't think it's because mosquitoes don't like me. I think it's because I've done the right things, taken the right steps and precautions. But this COVID is a whole other ball game. I feel um, at risk all the time. I'm nervous going out and taking a walk because of the people that aren't wearing masks. I'm anxious about um, going into a store if it's crowded. I won't go in at all. I, it would never occur to me now to go to a bar or a restaurant unless it's outdoor seating. And even then, I've walked out when they put the tables too close outside. Um, there's a lot we still don't understand about transmission of this virus, um, but it clearly is airborne. And that puts it in a whole other category. It's like the annual flu epidemic is here and you're trying not to get the flu. And how often have you been determined, I'm not getting the flu this year. And then boom, you're down sick for a week, right? A lousy week. Well, this is worse than that. This is very contagious and the disease itself is a whole lot worse than having the flu, no matter what our president says. Um, and I've, I've talked to any number of people who got infected way back in March and they're still sick. They're still fighting lingering symptoms. Um, they're still battling fatigue all the time. Um, they still have headaches and uh, neurological symptoms. Uh, they still have aching muscles and bones and a feeling of uh, brittleness and fragility uh, and of course depression. Um, so this is a this is a no funny business. This is a serious, serious microbe and it's different for me this time. Lori Garrett is taking it this seriously than everybody needs to be and then some. Uh, Lori, I want to thank you so much for this hour. It means a lot to have you on this discussion and for the 100th episode. And I know for the research community that's listening, that's read your books, thank you for those contributions over the years. And I know we'd all like for you to have a vacation, but at the same time, it's like, that would, would you still tweet? Because I need, <laughs> we, we, that's what we I still need, need that lifeline. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's what we all want is a digital holiday, but um, your voice is crucial right now. We're all going to keep listening and 
really appreciate this time with you. Thanks, Amelia. Thanks, Scott. Okay. And now we're going to turn to just going to take a breather here for a second and just come down from that really um, incredible conversation with Lori Garrett following a previous incredible conversation with Kim Fortune. And the only way to up the game at this point is to meet the production staff of COVID calls. And so I'm gonna bring them in now. Uh, coming on screen are Shivani Patel and Bucky Stanton. And I believe the third member of our team, Amber Ferreira, well, she's working right now and um, hopefully we'll be able to get her on in a minute, before I talk to Shivani and Bucky, I just want to take a, a second here and just offer thanks, of course, for every guest on COVID calls, everybody who has, has suggested a guest. I want to thank uh, my family far and wide and here close at, at hand, my wife and children who are also sort of extended production staff of COVID calls. I want to be sure to thank Esther Chernak at Drexel University um, for her inspiring leadership and her work and also being a, a guest on COVID calls multiple times. Also Sam Montano, Rashawn Ray, Lori Peak, who've been uh, guests multiple times. Andy Revkin, who has been a promoter of COVID calls from the very, very beginning and actually helped make the connection to bring Lori Garrett on today. Really thank you for that, Andy. Gonzalo Basagalupe, who's also been a guest twice and has also um, made our artwork for us. And then Drexel University, which has provided um, me a job and some funding to um, do this project. Many, many other people I'd like to thank, and we will do the that um, COVID calls is not stopping with the hundredth, so this isn't uh, uh, the end of it. But I did want to pause and thank all of those people who have contributed their time and creativity and energy and their own stamina um, as we've tried to talk with experts every weekday on on COVID calls. So, with that, Shivani, Bucky, hi. Hey. Hey, Scott. So would you mind introducing yourselves and uh, tell us a little bit about what you do with COVID calls? Shivani, can I start with you? Yeah, of course. Hi, you guys. Uh, my name is Shivani Patel, and I am a finance and econ major at the Lebeau College of Business. I'm a rising second year. Um, and basically what I do here at COVID calls is, um, so I'm a STAR student, which is basically stands for Students Tackling Advanced Research. Um, and for my creative project, I'm working with Scott on um, COVID calls. And what I do is I use um, this application called Otter AI. Um, and I use that to help basically develop speech to text transcription um, with all the other COVID calls that you guys have been listening to since like March. Um, so that's what I've been working on so far. And then in the coming weeks, I'm going to be helping Scott um, develop content, uh, help think of questions, um, connect with guests um, for a new se upcoming series, which is going to be revolving around the topic of education and COVID-19. So that's where we're at right now. So how many of the COVID calls have you listened to, Shivani? I have listened to 50 COVID calls. From the beginning to the end, music and everything. So, and you've listened to them in a very specific way, which is that you've got a transcript. You're listening to them, and you have a transcript, and you're you're literally solving the discrepancies between those two things, while also writing descriptions and finding the critical questions that come out of these discussions. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so, um, while I was talking about Otter AI. Um, while I'm listening to the each each podcast since March, I'm also um, fixing up any grammatical errors that the um, artificial artificial intelligence on Otter AI may have made. Um, I'm making sure that when when you read it, like when you read it in text, it flows nicely. And while I'm doing that, I'm also writing um, some compelling titles and overview descriptions so we can start transferring them over onto um, the main platform that all the podcast episodes go through. 
So when people go to the podcast uh, and they see the description, that's Shivani's work. And in the future, whatever COVID calls becomes, and as of today, we're going to have a million words of transcript. And as a uh, historian, this makes my head tingle. Um, Shivani's work has been really, really crucial with that. So um, Shivani, I want to just pass the mic over to Amber. Thank you so much for all you do. And Amber Ferreira, I want to bring you in. Um, would you mind telling everybody what you what you do with COVID calls, what your role has been? Um, I would say like primarily from like episode to episode, it's just um, trying to find any places where the audio cuts out um, because of, you know, um, being on this, <laughs> this interface. Um, I do like a little bit of like light EQing and such to try and make it sound a little bit less like it's going through like basically like FaceTime, like Zoom audio. Um, yeah, that's pretty much the majority of it is really cutting out um, sections where things got like muddy. There's sections where sometimes it'll almost sound like it's going through like an, an automated voice effect thing, which I try and get rid of. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just trying to like clean them up basically. That's what I do. So, you, so you've been doing oh, audio production music, yeah. on this. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, yeah, you did yeah. the music. So <laughs> I did, some I did people the only watch... Yeah. Yeah, some people watch on Periscope and some people um, watch on YouTube Live. But we encourage you to, to also check out the podcast because Amber wrote the music. Um, Amber, as I remember it, I kind of uh, said, hey, could you, what do you think about something that connotes like disaster, risk, fear, but also hope and make it sound like Wilco? And yeah. you went away and wrote this original extraordinary music which we use yeah, on the thanks. podcast tell us a little bit about your work as a as an as a creative artist oh yeah most definitely um primarily i would say my number one thing is i'm a producer um so i've been working on beats for like years which is basically how i went about um that so like when i go to like write music um if i'm given like a prompt you can like pick like a couple things that you like out of the song and then make a new song out of it so like wilco it's like you know acoustic guitars um, but like also like a fuzziness to it, like a later fuzziness, like softer to like more while well, keeping like a rock influence was kind of what I went for. Um, but uh, my, my main production style and stuff is is rap. And then I've started I started rapping um, in like December, I would say. Um, and I, I dropped a, a tape called Indigo, um, which is out on like streaming platforms and stuff. Um, it's under the name NC-17, but I'm probably going to change my name again um, before I, I drop Crimson, which is like the album I've been working on um, over the course of quarantine. Um, I'm also in a band called Chewy, um, and I'm the drummer in that band, which is fun. <laughs> yeah. You're keeping busy with so many things during this this pandemic. Yeah. You're based in Philadelphia, that's right, Amber. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm by Baltimore Ave. Okay, and Shivani, where are you calling from? I, I am calling from a Philly suburb. So I'm in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, which from like University City, it's about like 45 to 50 minutes away, depending on where you are. Okay, let me um, thank you both for that and for everything you're both doing. Let me come to uh, the one and only Bucky Stanton. What do you do? I uh, I don't really know how to answer the question entirely, but uh, I've had a number of shifting roles before Amber came on. I worked to uh, squeeze her music into some of the old episodes uh, and fill that backlog. I kind of serve as a system maker. I just kind of think up ways to make your life easier, my life easier. And now that I have these, these two uh, just my life easier i do the i do the physical uploading to to various sites and things and manage that and i do some scheduling too increasingly for you scott but aside from that i'm a phd student third year entering my fourth year at a rpi rensselaer polytechnic institute in the department of science and technology studies and i'm just kind of uh you're actually on my committee if you didn't know scott yeah, I, I remember. It's good. Okay. Uh, well, it was a. It was like a two months do, ago. So. And I do feel some guilt taking you away from your graduate studies, but uh, in a discussion with Kim Fortune earlier, it did occur to me that this is all. It's going to come full circle, for you and your graduate work. I think that hopefully this is aggregate and 
and helpful in the kind of work you're going to be doing rather than an aside, but valuable yes. work either way. And um, wanted to thank you also, Bucky, for always being available to run ideas past you. Uh, and uh, you don't always say that's a good idea, which I very val much value. Um, keep that to a minimum, which is nice. But, um, yeah. you know, your insights on the kind of, you know, questions we should be asking kind of guests are, are are really important and crucial. I'm gonna um, go give a quick round of the, with this group before I give some final comments. Um, Bucky, I'm gonna start with you. Um, mm -hmm. What has been your favorite COVID call so far to work on? To work on or to listen to? It, either one. Uh, okay, I'm gonna. I mean, I'm gonna weasel out, and I'm gonna say there's two favorites for just wow factor and. Just because I'm a graduate student, I'm always in the theory, in the field of science and technology studies. We have a very complicated relationship with theory and method and all those things. So more than your normal, you know, historian, even though I am your scholarly child in many ways, which feels weird to say live, but I I am engaged in those thoughts a lot. So the the Chakrabarti uh, interview is just really cool for me. And I've read a lot of his work and it was really, really interesting to see my mentor and uh, collaborator and close friend, you interact with this person that seems so distant and big, like such a big name for me. But in terms of listening regularly, I Wait, you, pretty much you had, broke up. You I, broke up when you, 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 it went glitchy when you said the name. Who, who was it? Uh, Chakrabati. Oh, Deepesh Chakrabati. Okay. Got it. Yes. Got it. Um, Thank you. Because that's one. that person is a very big scholar and has some really cool ideas. And it was just so that's cool to see that. I had a little bit of a star factor. But that was a good in terms of listening to regularly, I, anything Lori uh, Peck is in, or is it Peak? Peak. Peak. Yeah, anything she's in, I really love the conversations you two always have, as well as Escher uh, Chernick. Well, um, thanks, Bucky. Ember, you've worked mm -hmm. on a lot of these. I know you don't always have time, probably, in between everything else you're doing, to listen to them all closely for content because you're so busy fixing the audio. But mm -hmm. has there been one that grabbed your attention more than others? Yeah, I'm not going to say I remember um, the exact name, but around the time of the protest, there was one where you were talking about Tulsa um, with someone. I can't remember his name. Like the, um, the, the riots. And it was like going into extreme detail because I, I know like a little bit generally about the Tulsa um, or beforehand the Tulsa situation. Um, and it's just like one of those events in history that seems to just been been like lost somehow for some reason. It doesn't feel like it's taught to the extent that it really should be. Um, but he kind of went into detail about it. Um, it, it. And it was also like perfect timing because I, I actually like went to the protests and stuff. So like you had done like a couple of episodes right around there, which were like based on like racial issues, which is definitely my my personal favorite things. So that that was uh, Hannibal Johnson um, mm. in Tulsa, and and that was also the weekend of that Trump did the rally in Tulsa, if I've got it right. Yeah, um, yeah. That was an amazing. Which is so inflammatory. <laughs> yeah, it's an inflammatory yeah. thing that no, he did. That was... <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. But no, I no, got that was, to that talk. Was a really good one. That was really humbling to talk to him um, at that at that time. I agree with you. That one was really impressive. Um, so, Shivani, what about you? Um, there have been a lot that stuck out to me while I'm listening to all of these because I listen to them in great detail. Um, but one that that's coming to my mind right now is there was one with um, Sharona. Pearl and uh, Rashawn Ray, and it was about like face masks, basically the, the entire idea of face masks. And the one thing that stuck out to me that I really enjoyed listening to was um, there's always been this like historical notion in society that people who wear masks or face coverings always have like something to hide, I guess. And I just remember one point that I forget who made it, but um, it was about how um, Muslim women who wear hijabs or face coverings, it's like they're seen as a threat. Um, the Ku Klux Klan, they wear like the coverings, they're seen as a threat. So it's just like one of the conversations that really stuck out to me. 
Well, thank you. For, and that was a mind blowing one for me as well. Um, Shivani Patel, Amber Ferreira, Bucky Stanton, great to have you as a team. Uh, we have not all been in the same room together. Uh, it's a strange uh, artifact of this weird COVID time. You know, usually you do a project like this for many months, you're gonna get together first, get to know each other a little bit and then make something all together creatively, but we've kind of done it the other way around. Um, but we'll just have to keep making them until there's a time that we can actually all, all get together, I hope. Uh, so thanks again for everything you're doing. And, and thank you, you Scott. Healthy. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, Scott, this Scott. is the only reason I haven't collapsed into utter despair <laughs> or into a, into well, abyss of nihilism. Yeah, this is really a great, I appreciate a that. Good idea. Yeah. It, I, I've said it and I'll re it bears repeating today that this, and Lori Garrett really struck some, some, impressive notes in the way she described, but um, th this five o'clock hour has for me been a really good hour because uh, talking with people who I know are dedicated to trying to see our way through this. So I'm going to um, say goodbye to the three of you now, at least for now, uh, and see you later on the production side. And I'm going to just conclude today with a couple of brief comments. As of Today, August 7th, 2020, there are 19,189,737 confirmed cases of COVID-19 globally, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. That's up from 18,895,712 cases yesterday. Of those, 4,917,050 are in the U.S. That's up from 4,852,749 yesterday thunderstorm breaking behind me here, you may be able to hear. There are now a total of 160,702 deaths reported in the United States from COVID-19, up from 159,407 reported yesterday. Of those deaths, 618 have occurred in Mercer County, New Jersey, where I live, and 1,702 have occurred in Philadelphia, where I work. These are the communities that are home. My friend Lori Peake encouraged me early on with COVID calls to also look to human stories as a way to make sense of all of these numbers. And she was, of course, right, as she always is. I've read and will continue to read obituaries interspersed with stories of those who survive and those who support others in these bleak times. The main thing I'll try to keep doing with COVID calls is bring you daily discussions with people who have devoted their careers to trying to understand disasters and keep asking them why this is happening how we can cope and how we can avoid it, or at least make it less bad in the future. It's no more complicated than that. Those are the goals. I still believe that expertise matters. Getting expertise into circulation really matters right now, but I don't believe that expertise only resides in the academy. Disaster experts, as I've come to learn, are everywhere. Certainly in the sociology department and the public health school, and of course in the hospital and at the science news desk, but also in the dance studio and in the homeless shelter, and yes, even in the historical archives, whenever we can get back to those. Literally these days, COVID-19 is making each of us a disaster expert. If we care to think about what we're living through, talk about it, write about it, and share what we've found. There's also wisdom from caregivers, survivors, and much to be learned about the dead too. Things are happening so fast. And so we'll keep hearing about their lives and their struggles. We'll keep talking about and remembering those who suffered and died. One thing we've been shown by COVID-19 in a way we should have been able to see with climate change is the ways that this disaster, any disaster encircles all of us, brings us together into a community. Choose your scale, globe, nation, town, expertise, group, family. Whether we want to be in it or not, risk binds us. Disasters bind us into collective realities. Some people signal they wear the mask or they deny the threat overtaking their communities with a cry of getting back to business. But we are all encircled in a COVID-19 community now. And as it turns out, those bonds also include economic ties, the ties of a shared history of racial injustice. We are connected in ways we have tried to conceal, but now those bonds are made visible. This is what disaster research can do, bring out of obscurity 
the links of decisions made to protect some in the past and not others, to privilege some with health and to take privilege away from others across history. Disaster research can also suggest ways to keep those linkages across time and across space right in front of us, and to even suggest tools of analysis, care, and policy to keep the truth of disaster inequality right in front of us. And that is what COVID-19 is teaching us. Disasters reveal the inequalities in society. They put them right in front of us and they give us a choice as to what to do. It brings us through the present and potentially in the future, this pandemic and beyond it presents us with key choices as to the society that we wanna live in. I will keep talking with experts from every walk of life on COVID calls, documenting their ideas and their hopes and their suggestions on how to confront this disaster. I have upcoming collaborations with the American Philosophical Society, American Scientist Magazine, Whitney Plantation. I'm really excited for these collaborations. Also more students, more teachers, more artists, more clinicians and more survivors. One thing my guests have shared and I've heard time and again is that now that we see once again, what truly is, we're also liberated to imagine what we can recover into and that that could be something better than what we had before. Starting with the pronoun, could be a more inclusive we, more equity, more truth, stronger democracy, more care. I don't know if that's true, but if people much smarter than me keep telling me so, then I will keep listening and asking them questions. Please join me every weekday at five o'clock for COVID calls, five o'clock Eastern time. On Monday, I'm going to talk with Robert J. Lifton. And until then, please stay healthy. Thank you for joining me on this 100th episode of COVID Calls.